Support for Illinois lawmakers comes from the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Information available at paulsimoninstitute.org. Welcome to a special fall veto session edition of Illinois Lawmakers. I'm Jack Titchener, along with Amanda Vinicky of Illinois Public Radio. Amanda, you know, a lot of folks have been watching uh, the fall veto session as the uh, clock ticks down to the last minute on what's left of the stopgap budget. That, that expires on December 31st. There was a lot of hope around this building that, and the state that uh, some things would be worked out. But as you know, we found out a little earlier coming out of that leaders meeting, uh, things don't look good at all. Things don't look good in the slightest, Jack. If people were hoping for a budget for Christmas, I think instead they're going to get lumps of coal, in fact. So not a perhaps a good start to 2017. The leaders, and this is perhaps something to take away as significant, that after having not met for months, since summer really, they have at least been talking. So all four legislative leaders and the governor, and that in itself is significant. It's just that behind those closed door meetings, it doesn't seem as if we've had any true movement or negotiation. And actually, if anything, perhaps we saw a setback. There was a big hoopla after the Senate president made some comments about pension legislation. The governor then vetoed this measure that had to do with Chicago public schools and they're getting money. And that was supposed to be $215 million. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of dollars, right. a big money for CPS's budget. And uh, the Senate president said, You know, it wasn't really a a deal, or at least that's what it seemed to be. It might have just been an issue of semantics, but then the governor went and vetoed this legislation. The Senate's overridden it, and as of now, the House has not done the same. But what I think the bigger takeaway from that, unless you're a CPS administrator or a student, of course, is that it shows the deep levels of distrust and Senate President Cullerton saying, yeah, he'll still work with the governor on pension legislation, but he said he thought that they had actually the the, the parameters of a bill ready, and instead this might set back further negotiations. And you have this war of words between the speaker and the governor. The the, uh, speaker is saying, no, I never suggested another stopgap budget, Uh, but uh, the speaker is saying that, well, the governor wants a lame duck uh, tax increase. What is going on? It's all in the eye of who I think you, who, who you want to really believe or what have you. I, on one hand, as you said, you have the lame duck tax increase notion. Republicans trying to say that that's something that Democrats and Madigan has been talking about. They point back to comments that Madigan made actually a year ago at the City Club of Chicago that didn't directly call for a tax increase, but they're saying it as such. And then on the other hand, as you noted, Madigan framing any sort of lame duck tax increase as rounders. And then on the other hand, you also have, of course, the stopgap budget. Madigan saying, I want a full budget, not a stopgap one. And the speaker says, I want a full, we can do that. We've done it seven times before, but without any additional elements like the uh, turnaround agenda items. The governor's now insisting that if there's anything going to happen, there has to be term limits and there has to be... Property tax tax freeze. freeze. That's a really big ask for particularly just a temporary budget. These are things that Democrats have been very reticent to do in exchange for a full comprehensive budget, let alone a short-term one. So So, I don't think that'll happen. So what it comes down to is stay tuned until early next year. Stay tuned until early next year. I'll add that I think uh, representatives made it a little harder on themselves. They did pass a non-binding symbolic resolution that says it disavows a lame duck tax hike. But that means if there were to ever be an agreement, it's going to be a lot harder for legislators to go along with that in early January. Amanda Vinicky, thanks very much for your expertise. We always appreciate it. And up next on the program, we're going to hear from a couple of House veterans about uh, the view of the veto session from inside the Illinois House of Representatives. Joining me now on Illinois Lawmakers, Democratic State Representative Will Davis of Hazel Crest, the chairman of the House Elementary and Secondary Education Appropriations Committee. He also chairs the Health and Healthcare Disparities Committee in the Illinois House. Representative Davis is joined by Republican State Representative Steve Anderson of Geneva, who just won his second term in the Illinois House. Congratulations. Thank you. He uh, serves on the Judicial Civil Law, uh, Judiciary Civil Law Committee and also Cities and Villages. He's a former municipal attorney. Good to have you both on the program. Good. Uh, 
be here. Uh, thank you. As, as we talk about this, you know, today uh, there's a lot of chatter about uh, possibly a lame duck session vote on, uh, on taxes. Uh, lame duck, of course, is that little session in the early part of January where you can do things with a simple majority. Is that the correct understanding of that, Representative Davis? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so are you hearing much, uh, much chatter about that around the building? Well, you hear more of that chatter, not so much around here, but outside of the building, because that's what the expectation is in the media and others, is that they'll be forcing some kind of tax increase through in the lame duck session. Uh, I'm not hearing much of that here. Um, certainly, I've not had a lot of conversation about doing it. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that there needs to be a conversation about revenue here in the state, as well as, you know, a, a complete budget, you know, but just to say that lame duck is going to be solely for that purpose, there's much more that needs to be discussed relative to revenue in that session, more so than just that. It's a lot more complicated than that, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, the idea that the lame duck session would be a panacea for all of our problems and we could we could get everything that we haven't been able to do done for two years in, in a matter of days after the 1st of January seems very unrealistic to me. And also the idea of, of asking outgoing legislators to, to take those votes, I think, is not very representative representative of the people that they have originally been called to represent. Uh, if we're going to do it, let's do it at the right time with people who have been elected for full, for full terms. Well, there's actually a move on, on in, in the House as, as we talk about this, uh, about requiring a three-fifths supermajority in that, uh, in that uh, lame duck session. Well, I mean, I mean, of course, three-fifths majority means obviously that's a higher burden sure. that, that you have to do. I don't necessarily think you do that just to deal with what was just said in terms of asking out outgoing legislators to pass something. I mean, they still represent their districts until that very last day. And so if they feel that that issue is not representative of them and their districts, then they should vote no if that issue were to come up. And they have and they have lives to live in those districts after the uh, after they're out of office as well. Yeah, they do indeed. But at the same time, the concern that I think most people have is that there's a little less accountability when you know you're about to be out of office. You've been here in the legislature, Representative Davis, since what uh, 2003. Three, yes. And during your you're just coming into your second uh, uh, full term Correct. as a state representative. So you've been without a budget pretty much for all the time you've been here. While you've seen other approaches to this, and the reason we're here now is. Is the governor has a turnaround agenda of some things he believes are necessary to try to create uh, jobs in the state, to renew economic uh, activity, while a lot of folks on the Democratic side of the aisle are saying, well, we, we're for those things too, but we don't want to do away with 80 years of progressive uh, labor gains. That pretty much a summation of it? Well, in addition to labor gains, I mean, again, the idea of some of the turnaround items, again, we do support and want to move those issues forward. Um, but many of us think that to hold up the budgetary process in lieu of that is not the case. Because in many of those turnaround items, the, the, the benefit, if you will, of those won't come for years to come. So why are we holding up this year's budget looking at what may happen two, three, four years down the road with workers' comp or in any any of those items. So we've been able to discuss those items before, separate and apart from the budget. We passed the budget because that's what we're mandated to do. Um, and we've talked about some of those items. In 2011, we did pass a workers' comp reform, and we're now just seeing the results of that. So again, several years later, so why are we holding up the budget for something that may happen years down the road? The Republican caucus in the House and the Senate has pretty much stood solidly with the governor on this. Yes, indeed. Uh, are these must-have items before there will be any kind of revenue increase? I don't think that the governor or our caucuses have ever said anything as an absolute. The idea is we need to meet, we need to be together, uh, and quite frankly, the time for working groups and things like that is probably past. We've tried that for two years. It hasn't really gotten us much of a success. So the leaders need to be in the room together, and you know, I, I commend them. Uh, last week when they agreed that they would meet regularly every day uh, to try to hammer out some of those resolutions. But to say that there's absolutes uh, that we must have X, Y, or Z is, I don't think, a fair statement. Representative Davis, you were in on a, a hearing earlier this week about uh, uh, Republican leader Durkin's approach to uh, workers' compensation reform. One of the things the Republicans want is to tighten down on the idea of causation, which generally explained means that we want to make sure that whatever injury the the, uh, the uh, worker has is job related. 
Uh, is that pretty much the gist of, of, of what's in what's in play at the moment? Uh, I would probably argue that causation in and of itself is the linchpin to getting some type of workers' comp compensation done. There are some other issues about medical fee schedules and things of that nature, mm -hmm. but I think causation is the is the one real sticking point that we have. Speaker Madigan says that uh, if if you go too far on that, you're basically sending workers uh, uh, to the, to the emergency room for uh, for 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 health care. Uh, is there any room for give in this? Well, there should be. Now, what I learned at this hearing is that our causation standard is, is the same as Indiana. Um, we've heard a lot that Illinois should be more like Indiana, is my understanding. At least in that hearing, we, we were told by a workers' comp attorney that our causation standard is the same as Indiana. But the problem, as I understand it, is that the what they pay for workers comp is a lot less in Indiana is that about it, right? It's significantly less uh, but I don't believe that the standards are the same even if the language is substantially similar the causation standard in Illinois has been lessened by Illinois case law to the extent that we're no longer talking about even you know 50 percent causation we're talking about uh, effectively no causation is required in Illinois if you're at work and you suffer an injury whether you're there, you're physically there or not you're covered. One of the areas I want to touch upon, of course, this is the veto session, and one of the uh, bills that uh, was uh, vetoed was the automatic voter registration bill, where you could have that done automatically at a number of state agencies, like the, your driver's license facility. Uh, fell four sh votes shy of uh, being overridden in the Illinois House this week. What happened, Representative? Well, apparently, you know, to the extent in which many people think that the Democrats have a supermajority, we haven't had a functioning supermajority, essentially, in a last two years. But it's just one of those issues that some people just didn't vote for. I, I don't know if that's a function of not having everybody in the chamber, but I think you saw basically Democrats vote for it, Republicans vote against it, and I don't see why we're not encouraging uh, to register as many people as possible. That bill had passed with a, a healthy number of Republicans on it originally. That's what correct. happened? Well, you'd have to talk to those individuals. I voted against it both the first time and in the veto. The difficulty that I believe we substantially have with it is not that we're against automatic voter registration. In fact, Representative Fortner has a bill filed that, that does exactly that. The difficulty was the implementation of it within the agencies. We have siloed agencies that don't know how to communicate with each other, literally can't communicate with, with each other, and the risk that we would have duplicate uh, uh, registrations occurring was substantial, and we're adding to the bottom line burden for those agencies and what they have to do in an area that they're not trained to do. So we think that there were some flaws with it that caused us to vote against it. That's not to say that there isn't a good version of it out there that we could pass in a bipartisan way. So it way. could be revisited at some point? Well, it probably will sure. be revisited. I mean, I think voter registration is important to both sides. Agree. Um, another bill, another uh, bill that keeps changing uh, as we, probably even as we talk, is trying to save a couple of uh, nuclear power plants, one in the Quad Cities area and uh, the other north of Decatur at Clinton. Uh, Exelon wants uh, some help through uh, with ratepayers on that. Uh, the bill has gone through a lot of manifestations. Uh, at this point, uh, coal-powered plants in southern Illinois have been pulled off of that. Is this thing going to pass? Uh, it's being billed as a. It's being sold as a jobs bill for those areas, but a lot of the other, a lot of other parts of the state have a problem with it because of the impact on utility payers. Well, it's certainly a, a very tough issue. I don't think even the last version that was in committee yesterday, Amendment Number Three. I don't even think that that's going to be the final amendment. I think there'll still be some additional dialogue, some probably some more give on the side of the utility companies to try to make it a little bit more palatable. But it's not just a jobs bill just for those areas. We have to look at jobs across the state that are that come about by way of the utility companies training opportunities as well I have to look at it in a broader sense than just those specific areas and and I'm encouraging the dialogue to continue so that we can look at jobs in other parts of the state as well and it's been a concern of yours from the uh, environmental standpoint. Correct. I'm a member of the Green Caucus. I am a co-sponsor of the original Clean Jobs Bill. This bill isn't just a, a bill concerning nuclear power plants. This bill is about our renewable portfolio standards in Illinois, which concern how we produce power and incurring, encouraging us to move forward or even mandating the state to move forward in renewable sources of power. That's going to generate jobs throughout the state, as Representative Davis indicated, something that's very important. 
but it's certainly correct that this is a moving target right now. The bill has changed a lot, and until we see the final form, it's going to be really difficult to evaluate. It, it may be one of those issues that carries on, carries over into the new session as well, because it, it is so well. complicated. Mm -hmm. Representative Davis, Representative Anderson, thanks very much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. We appreciate it. And coming up next on the program, we're going to hear from two of those lame ducks, two veteran members of the Illinois Senate, who will not be returning in the next session of the Illinois General Assembly. Joining me now on Illinois Lawmakers, and I don't say this lightly, two of my favorite members of the Illinois Senate, Assistant Senate Majority Leader John Sullivan, Democrat of Rushville, and Assistant Senate Republican Leader David Lechtefeld of Oakville. Good to have you on the program uh, one more time. Good to be here, Jack. Senator Lechtefeld, you will have served 22 years uh, by the time your term ends, and I believe uh, you will have served 14 years. That's correct. That's a total of something like 36 years. That's a lot of institutional knowledge that's going to be walking out the door here shortly. Uh, there's a lot of talk of term limits. The governor's for that. Uh, a lot of people in the public like it. Uh, Speaker Madigan, not so much. Uh, what do you think about the idea, Senator Lechtefeld? Well, you know, I've been here for 21 years, so it's pretty hard for me to say, you know, we, we, I, I, I can live with term limits. I, I, could, I can live with that. That's not a problem. I'm not real sure that it solves the problems that people think it does. Um, you know, you, you, uh, it takes you a while to learn to, to, do, to, do, to know what's going on around here. And, uh, you know, I, a lot of times I, I've talked to people from other states who have term limits, and, and their answer is that it really doesn't change as much as you think it does. Senator, uh What's your take on it? Yeah, you know, I've, of course, I've um, said many times publicly that we have term, term limits right now, and it's called an election. So every two or four years, we all have to run for office, and uh, certainly in our districts especially, you know, we feel very strongly that if you're not doing a good job, you're, you're likely not going to stay in office. So, uh, And I also have talked to uh, legislators in other states that have term limits, and, and really it just shifts the power from, you know, legislators, elected officials to the bureaucrats. And uh, I just, I don't see where it's really solved any of the problems right. that many people think it's going to. And some of the data s seems to indicate, too, that it doesn't have much impact on policy. It doesn't do much in terms of tax increases or the way the General Assembly actually does most of its business. Mm -hmm. um, of course, as, as, we're, as we're talking uh, today, uh, during the last uh, couple of days of the veto session, there's a lot of talk around the building, particularly in the press, about the impact of uh, the so-called 16 lame duck legislators who won't be coming back in, into, uh, into the new session uh, starting in January. Uh, there's talk of possibly uh, uh, a tax increase uh, being, being run during that lame duck session. Uh, what, what are you guys hearing? You know, um, there's a lot of speculation and as you said, a lot of chatter out there as, as far as people talking about the possibility of a tax increase being voted on during lame duck, but you know, I, I, right now, from my perspective, Dave will certainly have his opinion here. But I just think that we're really too far apart in, in trying to reach an agreement on a you know a grand bargain, if you will. Uh, Governor Rauner certainly is still talking a, a lot about his turnaround agenda. Speaker Madigan and the Democrats have said, you know, we'll talk about the budget, but we're going to talk about the budget not not in conjunction with this turnaround agenda. So I just still see a, a big uh, chasm there, if you will. And uh, I just don't think, I think there's an awful lot that would have to happen between now and January the 9th or 10th uh, be before there would be that kind of a uh, process happen. First of all, on the question before, I would like to say I, I am convinced of this. Term limits, I don't, I don't think will make that much difference. I think something we should have is limits on leadership. You know, whether it be 10 years or whatever, I think if in leader, leadership you, you accumulate so much power over a period of time. I, I really think that's something, but we could do that without, we could do that on our own if we really wanted to do that. Now, as far as the issue of uh, tax increase, and uh, you know, I, I agree with John. There, there, there's, there has to be some sort of an agreement before we even talk about that. You know, I, I am convinced that if you're going to fix this state, it'll have to be a combination of, of holding the line and probably some new revenue. And, 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 I, and I'm certainly not a big fan of, of new revenue, but in the end, I, I think we're in such bad shape right now, you can't do, you can't fix it without a little of both. And, it, and at this point, you know, the, uh, the uh, stopgap budget that was approved back in June, uh, parts of that will expire at the end of December. And so you're going to see a whole new round of uh, 
questions and uh, outcry from the higher education community. Uh, you know, there was some money uh, some money that was uh, doled out to uh, three universities last week as an emergency uh, spending situation. You're hearing from folks at Southern Illinois University in your district. You're hearing from the higher education uh, community in, in your district in Western Illinois. Uh, so. Is, it, is there any hope that uh, you know, something is going to happen soon, sooner than later, or is it going to be another series of these stopgap bills uh, ad infinitum? Right now, it, does, it appears that that's where we're headed. It's not the way to do business. Each, each one of those stopgap measures get us deeper in debt. You know, I, I've, I've said for a while now, and you know, I've talked about this, Jack, there is a point where we, we simply bury ourselves so deep that it would be politically impossible to get out of. And, and that's that's a scary point, and and the more the longer we wait, the, the worse it's going to be. And it, it doesn't appear there's anything happening right now, unless you know something, John, that I don't know, uh, that's that's going to fix this. But you're going to have to come up with something soon, I would think. Uh, I'd hope that would be this week, uh, maybe maybe in the in the veto in the uh, you know the the next uh, veto session uh, after the first of the year. But even there, it, it looks doubtful right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I would say that. We have to do something because, as you said, the, the current stopgap budget expires December 31st. So the universities and many other organizations and agencies are going to run out of the ability to authorization to spend money after that in January. So something has to happen. Now, we talked earlier about a grand bargain. That, that's, I don't think that's likely. So the next alternative, I guess, is uh, another you know, short-term stopgap budget, which doesn't fix the problem. It simply kicks the can down the road. Uh, but uh, we have to do something. And uh, and if it's another stopgap, I, th I think that's probably the bare minimum. And if that's going to happen, I, again, I think it's going to happen probably in the first uh, few days of January, if that's going to happen. So I do believe we will be back here in Springfield that first uh, week or 10 days in January, <coughs> excuse me, uh, working on some sort of a budget uh, compromise. Gentlemen, did, did the election results really move the needle here in terms of the balance of power in Springfield? The House Democrats lost a, a, a net total of four seats. Two seats were lost in the Senate majority, super majority uh, in the Senate for the Democrats. Uh, has that really changed the playing field here in, in, in the Capitol? You know, it hasn't, obviously, because of the majorities. I mean, the Democrats still control both the House and the Senate. We still have a super majority in the Senate. Uh, so it hasn't changed it from that perspective. And, and in fact, I think it's actually driven a further, because of the negativity of this past election cycle, I think it's actually just driven a, a deeper chasm between the, the, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, certainly between the governor and, and the Democrats. Uh, I think it's even going to make it more difficult to try to find compromise. It was such a nasty, nasty campaign on so many different levels on both sides. I'm not, not blaming anybody here. but. Uh, so I think it's even going to, even though the numbers changed a little bit, majorities haven't changed, and uh, I don't think it's going to do anything to, uh, to really, certainly, certainly not going to help to bring any compromise, I don't believe. Senator Lechtfeld? Well, the only thing that's different is that, that the Democrats do not have a supermajority in both houses. I mean, that's very obvious. Uh, they found it very hard last time because of one of, one of their members who, who uh, kind of revolted. But that, that's different. That, uh, everything else is basically the same. Basically, Madigan and, and Cullerton could have done what they wanted to do if they wanted to override anything the governor did, but I'm not real sure that they wanted to pass a tax increase by themselves. So, you know, I, I'm convinced of this. The more and more that I've been here, this state will never be back what it can be unless we can, we can create a situation in which people want to come here and, and jobs and, and businesses want to come. They're leaving in droves. That has to be addressed sooner or later. If not, no matter what we do, I don't think it'll fix it. And that's the major sticking point, though. That's elements of the governor's uh, turnaround yeah. agenda, yeah. which is pretty hard for a lot of uh, Democrats to get behind, although the Senate President, John Cullerton, has, has kept uh, somewhat more of an open mind about some of these things. Right, right. And, you know, let, let me go back to the supermajorities just for a minute. Yes, the House has had a supermajority in the numbers, but in reality, right. they were not really able to do much with... Uh, 
trying to override vetoes or use as supermajority because there are some pretty conservative members there. You know, as far as uh, the Senate president, I mean, John has always been a type of an individual who's willing to bring everybody to the table and try to find compromise, try to find middle ground on issues. He's done that. That's He's really built his career on that. And uh, I think that we could, when we set our minds to it, and Dave, I agree with you, we do we do need to make some changes in the state to make it, um, to, to change attitudes uh, for the public and business here, number one. But we also have to uh, set our minds to the fact that we're going to come together, find some compromise, and that's what it's going to take to move us ahead. Uh, Jake, Jake, there could be, I, I told John the other day, so John, if you and I got together, <laughs> we could fix it in, in not, you know, it's going to take a long time to fix this state, but we could come up with some things that would work, that people want to come here and start to pay our bills. But but obviously, there's too many, too much politics involved. I, I, I firmly believe that the two of you could probably get it worked out yeah. over coffee a couple yeah, of mornings. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Senator Sullivan, Senator Electable, it's been a pleasure working with you over the years. Thank you for your service to the citizens of Thank Illinois. You. We certainly appreciate it. Thank I wish you, you the best. Illinois lawmakers will be back in January with live coverage of the governor's State of the State speech. And later, of course, the governor's budget message here on public television stations around the state of Illinois. From all of us at Illinois lawmakers, happy holidays and so long from Springfield. Thank you.